Oh man, I guess since we had our first Gen 3 Pokemon last episode with the patron pick, you guys just had to vote in the comments for our first solo Gen 4 Pokemon, huh? Although it feels weird to me that we're doing a solo Gen 4 Pokemon before we've even done the Gen 2 or 3 starters and legendaries. I mean, hey, you guys voted for it, so I just make the vids. And what a Pokemon it is. This week's episode will focus on the land shark Pokemon, Garchomp. Oh boy, I'm sure you guys have heard us mention this beast before, and that's for good reason. Listen, Cynthia knew what she was doing when she had this as her strongest Pokemon. That's champion level material. I remember struggling against this thing as a preteen because I didn't bring any ice attacks and I wasn't quite aware that the stats in the game actually mattered yet. Anyways, we've got a lot to talk about, so let's get right into it. How good was Garchomp actually? And as always, this video will start with these competitive formats. As always, let's start out with the stats. You already know, Garchomp is in that special tier of pseudo-legendary Pokemon, meaning it's a 3-stager with a 600 base stat total. And boy are those stats good. In fact, Garchomp's stats are incredibly similar to another pseudo-legendary, Salamence, both having devastatingly high attack stats and extremely good speeds. Though Garchomp sacrifices a bit of firepower for just a tiny extra horsepower. While Salamence has a respectable special attacking stat as well, Garchomp garters just a bit more bulk, especially notable in the defense department. Garchomp's typing is also one of its biggest benefits. Bear in mind that in pre-fairy days, the only thing that resisted dragon types was steel types. But what's Garchomp's other typing? Ground, of course, meaning many steel types couldn't even stand up to Garchomp. And then those that could resist its dual stab assault or had enough defense to withstand fell victim to its move pool. With Fire Fang, Garchomp ate up any possible roadblocks on its path to destruction, made all the more powerful by its access to Sword Stance. After a single Sword Stance boost, Garchomp was capable of two-hit KOing every single Pokemon in the game. Let that sink in. That's going to be important. Very important. As if that wasn't enough, Garchomp had access to Sand Veil. Simply the presence of a Hippowdon or a Tyranitar, both incredibly common, gave Garchomp an extra 20% evasion. So even any would-be counters could just get unlucky and lose. Now remember that stat about Garchomp 2 KOing every Pokemon? Here's the kicker. Many pseudo-legendaries were balanced by their 4 times weakness to 1 typing, and Garchomp is no different. As with many of its fellow Dragon pseudo-legendaries, it had a 4 times weakness to Ice, but with a Yacht Berry, only one Pokemon in the entire game could outspeed it and one-hit KO it, a Choice Banded Jolly Weavile. Since the definition of a counter and Pokemon is something that can switch in, take a hit, and then beat the other Pokemon, Garchomp quite literally had no overuse counters. Weavile got absolutely demolished by any attacks, and other potential quote-unquote counters, Starmead, Gengar, and Deoxys Speed, all failed to one-hit KO Garchomp if it had a Yachberry. Also, Outrage would still kill them. It was just Earthquake they could survive if predicted properly. Garchomp would almost always get the setup, and once it's set up, nothing could win the 1v1. That's where those extra defenses made such a big difference. This Sword Stance set was inarguably the most common and powerful set in overuse. I'm going to spoil things a little bit, but Garchomp actually got banned to Ubers because of this set. Beating it required multiple Pokemon 100% of the time, frequently one to bait out the Yachberry and then another to kill Chomp after it was locked into Outrage. If save for the mid game when some of its checks were gone, Garchomp would frequently auto win the game. End game scenarios frequently came down to Chomp versus Chomp, and then it was just who was lucky with a speed tie or a Sandville dodge. Because of all these things, Garchomp was deemed too powerful for overuse, and it even thrived in Ubers, where Sandville and its great match matchups against the many dragon types and ubers gave it a berth as a potential sweeper. And we're not done talking about Gen 4 Garchomp yet though, because as strong as the Sword Stance set was, Garchomp was too good to be running only one set. Many of these sets transfer over to ubers, but we'll talk about the overused versions first. The most notorious set outside Sword Stance was Garchomp's substitute set. The quote unquote uncounterable nature of Garchomp meant it would very frequently get the setup. With substitute, Sword Stance, and its choice of two attacks, Garchomp could rely on Sandveld to get a really devastatingly lair of boost up. One miss for the opponent meant a ridiculous behemoth was staring you down. Salak Berry boosted it to Choice Scarf levels, making it sweep pretty much unstoppable, while Bright Powder increased the chances of taking out something in the opponent's plan to stop you, or an additional boost. If the substitute was kept up, not even priority moves would foil this Garchomp. This set usually ran Dragon Claw so as to not potentially screw over its setup by being locked into Outrage. It was liable to be walled by Skarmory or Bronzong if running Earthquake, so Fire Fang sometimes filled the last spot. This set for Go prediction for guaranteed boosts. If waiting for setup wasn't your thing, Choice Band gave Garchomp immediate killing power. Dragon Claw, Outrage, Earthquake, Fire Fang, and Stone Edge gave Garchomp coverage on the entire metagame. As other choice items, Choice Scarf Garchomp was obviously one of the best revenge killers 
in the game, utilizing those same moves but with Fire Fang frequently subbed out for its more threatening Blast version. Finally, the notorious Chain Chomp. If you're watching our Tyranitar video, you'll remember that Tyranaboa was a special attacking lure set designed to eliminate potential common switch-ins. Enter special attacking Garchomp. 80 base special attack wasn't much to work with, but Draco Meteor was the reason the set worked. This Garchomp typically would Sword Stance against something that didn't threaten it, not giving away the fact that Meteors were about to rain down on the opponent because it didn't show its lower attacking powers. Then on the switch, boom, Draco Meteor, boosted by a Life Orb. With Earthquake and Fire Blast, this Garchomp could also handle Steel types and Blissey if it switched in. So what counters were there? Like I said, not any by the actual definition of counter. Certain Pokemon did a better job at beating it with prediction though. Suicune and Slowbro had the bulk and attacking power to switch in and potentially heavily damage Chomp, even one hit KOing it if it didn't have Yachberry. The aforementioned Weavile, Starmie, and Gengar could do okay, but weren't true counters. Really, it was Yachberry and the fact that Sandstorm would almost always be up that made Chomp so strong. Pokemon that could switch into it like Cresselia or Celebi couldn't kill it and took damage from Sandstorm. Outrage was just such a devastatingly powerful powerful move that it virtually eliminated other Pokemon's chances to do anything. Frequently the plan was just to lock Chump into Outrage and then send in your Revenge Killer, but if you're dealing with a different set, that could even fail like Weavile losing to the Scarf set. All in all, Garchomp was one of the best Pokemon in the game, and certainly an overuse in Gen 4. Its ban to Ubers marked the huge shift at Smogun, as it was the only second non-legendary Pokemon to ever be banned after Wobbuffet. And Wobbuffet was a different type of Pokemon, but with Shadow Tag and its counter moves. Garchomp changed competitive Pokemon definitively. All that Pokemon transferred over quite nicely into VGC, where Garchomp could play extremely straightforward and rely on its power and great ability to carry it through. Although there wasn't much rooms for Swords Dance set up, a 130 attack stab earthquake is something any team needed to fear. Paired with Zapdos for the famous disc quake combo, Garchomp became one of the staples of the VGC 2009 metagame. Dragon Claw was always run over Outrage because you can't choose Outrage targets and doubles, and past that Garchomp had Protect, Rock Slide, and Crunch or even its own Sandstorm to choose from. It saw a lot of success, winning Phoenix Regionals under Makari and taking the Dallas Regionals on the team of Alaka. And by the time Worlds rolled around, Rain had become the dominant playstyle. In fact, making up three of the top four teams, but don't get us wrong. Garchomp was a big part of the 2009 metagame, although it didn't fare as well in 2010, where the Ubers that dominated the game outclassed it. Without setup, it really couldn't contend. Garchomp actually spent a good deal of Gen 5 banned from overuse, but it was mostly because of one thing, Sandvale. That massive 20% evasion boost enabled Garchomp to potentially straight up beat counters and checks if the opponent was unlucky. And given what rampant destruction Garchomp could enact if there were no counters, that could end the game. But in October 2012, something huge happened. Garchomp got a new ability, Rough Skin, from Dream World. The Smogun Council unbanned Garchomp from Ubers, but banned Sandvale and Snowcloak, the hail version of the ability, under the new evasion clause. From that moment, Garchomp was once again allowed to run in overuse. The metagame had changed in its absence, but it was still a powerful threat. That signature Yacht Swords Dance set was still terrifying in much the same incarnation, with the only differences being a shift to Fire Blast or Aqua Tail instead of Fire Fang. Likewise, Subsolak made a very strong threat, all but guaranteed, only vulnerable to Revenge Killers and Skarmory and Bronzong. Likewise, Choice Sets, whether Scarfed or Banded, fulfilled the same roles as a great Revenge Killer and immediate Kaiju level threat. But Garchomp's 100 and two base speed, previously incredible, was now just above average. Keldeo, Terrakion, Latios, and more were new additions to the overused metagame that outsped Garchomp. Latios and Latias were the most noteworthy new members of overuse. Their ability to run past Garchomp and one hit KO with a Draco meter was a primary reason that it wasn't as dominant. It was also why that Yachberry set wasn't the most common chomp around anymore. It finally had things that could beat it. Instead, Garchomp actually fell into using a move distinctly opposed to its nature as a fast and strong sweeper, Stealth Rock. With a good bulk and an immediately offensive threat, Garchomp made usual stealth rock counters extremely afraid to switch in. Zatu and Espeon dared not to come in on Garchomp, making the rocks all but guaranteed. From there, Outrage and Earthquake still formed the potent core they always had, and Fire Blast could handle those pesky Skarmories and Bronzongs. For offensive teams looking for stealth rock support, Garchomp fit the role arguably better than anything outside of Lander Asterion, and it could still even Swords Dance in this role to become the same powerhouse as always has been, although it meant forsaking some coverage. Stealth Rock also made appearance in Garchomp's mix set, which never really had much use of Swords Dance anyways, and in a new tank set. Though tank seems antithetical to Garchomp, Rough Skin and Rocky Helmet let it rack up a ton of residual damage, and with Dragon Tail, Stealth Rock, and Toxic, it could potentially force the opponent into a hellish situation, 30% damage to physical attackers every time they hit. Overall, Garchomp didn't change that much. The biggest changes were the addition of Stealth Rock and the potential appearance of Dual Chop to break Sashes or Subs. It was still a nigh uncounterable Pokemon because of its sheer strength and versatility, but there were significant 
significantly more things capable of checking and revenge killing it. As always, Skarmory and Bronze Dog did good provided they avoided Fire Blast. Steel types like Heatran, Jirachi, Scizor, Ferrothorn, and Fortress would win out if they locked Garchomp into Outrage, but lost outright to its other moves. Landorus T and Gliscor avoided super effective damage, but still had to be wary of the new raw power behind Outrage. Although Landorus T's Intimidate and Defenses did let it do well against Garchomp, it was those that could outspeed and kill it that were the best solution. Eladio's coming in on a predicted Earthquake would swiftly end Garchomp's hopes and could beat its Scarf sets with their own. Other Scarf Dragons like Hydreigon, Salamence, and Curum Black were the most powerful revenge killers, bypassing Yachberry, which stimmied potential Ice Shard users like Mamoswine. Status was one of the strongest Garchomp stoppers, as Paralysis or a burn from the likes of Rotom Wash were not good for its sweeping chances. All in all, each set had solutions, but Garchomp was the same monstrous land shark it always had been, just with a good amount of less hacks involved. Partnered with another dragon or Magnezone to remove its checks, it was fully capable of routing teams on its own. It even still made appearances in Ubers after it moved down their overuse because of how good it was there. While Garchomp couldn't compete in VGC 2011 because it was Unova decks only, it most certainly made its mark in VGC 2012. In fact, it won a world championship under the best to ever do it, Ray Rizzle, who won his third worlds using Garchomp. Ray's Garchomp was actually a little bit different from the norm. He used a Bond Berry and a high special defense to resist Draco Meteor spam from some of the most popular Pokemon in the meta, Latios and Hydreigon. The moveset, however, was standard. After surviving a Draco, Dragon Claw could one-hit KO back and substitute made Garchomp potentially game-ending, as it could cause mass damage with Earthquake. Protect was a VGC staple. Paired with Hydreigon, the two rained destruction on the enemy team with their spread moves. A more standard Garchomp was seen on 8th place with Junpei Yamamoto, who ran the commonplace max attack and speed EVs along with Rock Slide, but with Focus Sash instead of Yachberry or Dragon Gem. But 5th placer Sage in Park, who has a history of innovating, used Rough Skin Life Orb Garchomp of all things for his high placing. This speaks to the variety Garchomp could use in its many different sets, one of the hallmarks of its iteration. In 2013, it only had one top 8 appearance at World, 7th on the team of Leprox. In fact, that was Garchomp's only top 48 appearance. This was due to the fact of the advent of Landorus Therian, who pretty much provided everything Garchomp did, fast, strong earthquakes in bulk, while also bringing Intimidate. Two pretty big obvious changes we need to talk about in Gen 6 are Fairy Type and Garchomp's Mega Evolution. Fairy Typing actually wasn't as bad for Garchomp as one might think. While Fairy Types of course made great counters to Garchomp, the fact that Fairy is completely immune to Dragon meant that a Fairy Type switch in in fact didn't lock Garchomp into Outrage like a Steel Type would, and Garchomp's Earthquake could still eliminate weakened fairies, or mess them up big time with proper prediction. This was a huge change for sure, one we'll talk about more in the counter section. But as far as movesets went, it mostly meant that Garchomp didn't run Yachberry anymore. As for the Mega Evolution, Garchomp's attack went to positively astounding levels once Mega evolved, and the additional 20 defense and 10 special defense didn't hurt either. In Sand, that Earthquake was absolutely monstrous thanks to Sand Force, but all that paled in comparison to the loss of 10 points in speed. 10 speed that let Garchomp outrun a huge amount of base 100 threats, like Salad comments both Mega Charizards, Mega Gardevoir, and Mega Medichan. Swords Dance Mega Garchomp was an overkill Pokemon that was used mostly to break through defensive teams. In other situations, Rough Skin was more valuable, and that speed certainly made the difference. It's a good sign of restraint on Game Freak's side that they didn't give Garchomp more tools throughout the generation. The only real changes to sets were the ubiquity of Life Orb on Swords Dance variants now that Yachberry had been phased out. Other than that, it was business as usual. Swords Dance, Earthquake, Outrage, and some Fire and Rock type coverage moves. And as always, that that was enough to make Garchomp a top tier threat. With a new generation came a few new counters though. On the side of things that could outspeed, Mega Manetric, Mega Deontay, and Ice Punch Mega Metagross could all stop non-choice variants in their tracks. And Mega Metagross even beat the Scarf ones due to its bulk. Mega Scizor and Mega Slowbro took on roles on the defensive counters side, though they had to be wary of an already boosted Garchomp, or in Scizor's case, that pesky Fire Blast. The biggest counters were the aforementioned fairy types, specifically Azumarill, Clefable Sylveon, and Mega Altaria. However, even those could lose to Version that always had a boost up. That is, except for unaware Clefable, who was, well, unaware of the monstrous attacking stat it was facing down. Azura was noteworthy for its ability to tank an earthquake and then retaliate with a play rough to take out Garchomp. But perhaps the best fairy type counter was Togekiss, who utterly walled any Garchomp without rock type coverage, taking on a fairy type version of the role Skarmory and Bronzong played. But by this point, I think you guys understand. Regular Garchomp was still great. Overused, 100%. Luckily for Garchomp, it was native to the Kalos decks, meaning VGC 2014, which was Kalos decks only, eliminated its genie competition. While it still had a large number of checks and counters like Scarf, Mega Gardevoir, Salamence, and Hydreigon to worry about, Garchomp made sure everyone knew it was one of the top dogs, or land sharks. Again, with its combination of Earthquake and Rock Slide for spread moves and the always reliable Dragon Claw to hit opposing dragons, its main change was that it usually ran Rough Skin now, as Tyranitar was a bit less 
less prevalent. Garchomp was used on both finals teams of Worlds 2014. That includes the team of winner Seijin Park, who if you'll remember used the Pachirisu that shocked the world to win the trophy. In fact, it was Pachirisu and Garchomp who formed the winning duel, as Pachirisu enabled Garchomp to wreak havoc without the fear of getting knocked out by opposing Draco meters. How's that for an unlikely couple? But Garchomp was not nearly as surprising as Pachirisu. In fact, six of the top eight teams at Worlds that year used Garchomp, and finals in every division, junior to masters, had a Garchomp on both sides. In fact, Garchomp was the most used Pokemon at Worlds, with 29 of the top 60 players packing it. Only one Mega though. Garchomp also was on the teams of the winners of the UK Nationals, German Nationals, third at US Nationals, you get the picture. An amazing year for Garchomp. Perhaps one of the biggest reasons it did so well was that it outsped Mega Kangaskhan, who was banned from singles, but a dominant force in VGC. Take that, Mega Kang. Garchomp doesn't even need a Mega Evolution to beat you, but to be fair, you lose speed when you Mega Evolve. And that's it, so how good was Garchomp actually? In a word, amazing. Very few non-legendary Pokemon can claim to have been overused every gen since release. Although to be fair, Garchomp started at 4, but but yeah. Garchomp is one of the only Pokemon that was even higher than overused at some point. There are very few Pokemon that could be argued to have been game-defining as Garchomp, although I could think of a few in Gen 3. One of the first non-legendaries to be banned, one of the reasons for the implementation of Invasion Claws, winner of multiple VGC champions, being used a lot, having really high uses in VGC 2017 to either team with or take out Tapu Koko, it was even runner-up last year. And this gets even more dramatic when you realize that the version of Garchomp overuse is the one without its best ability, with Sandveil. With Sandveil, it's disgusting. And unlike some Pokemon who are banned to Ubers and then faltered there, Garchomp could even run with the best Pokemon in the game. Garchomp is bar none one of the best Pokemon ever released in the game, and certainly one of the best non-legendaries. A fitting choice for our first ever Gen 4 Pokemon. Thank you so much to our patrons for continued support of our videos, and thank you to all of you as well. As always, if you like the video and want to see more, be sure to subscribe to Fall Swipe Gaming for more weekly Pokemon content. And of course, as I always say, comment on what Pokemon you want to see next. Follow my crew on these social media platforms. That's all I got. See you next week, everyone.